Okay, last week, Pastor Joey has started with this question, what are you afraid of? And I will give you some of the things that we are afraid of, and I will start with this, fear of death. Like, let's admit it, right? All of us want to go to heaven, but no one wants to go first. <laughs> Most of the fear is actually connected with death, right? We are fear of heights or anything. It's actually because we're afraid to die. So it's more connected to death. Then another one is fear of pain or discomfort. That's why we're afraid to go to hell, right? So some people might tell you, especially those in the, in the, in the Philippines, they may tell you, where do you go if you die? Then they, will, then they will tell you, if you don't believe in God, you go to hell. So they will explain to you what hell looks like in excruciating details, as if they were born and lived there. <laughs> right? And then you also want for the fear of losing. You, know, you lose your work or lose your husband, you lose your wife, you lose anything that you're afraid of. And then we fear of missing out. Sometimes we're afraid that our Instagram friends are earning more than us, right? Like when they say a, uh, some kind of investment that they're putting in, putting in their Instagram or Facebook that they're earning this, you want to join because we don't want to miss out. And then another thing is we are afraid of being afraid. If you hear someone who feel something wrong, eventually you also feel there's something wrong with, with me, right? But all of this, can, we can also relate that this is because of fear of our uncertainty, because fear of unknown. And these are the what's of fear. What are we afraid of? There's also another question. Who are we afraid of? And of course, there are only two answers. We are afraid of other people because those other people will and can inflict pain or able to kill us. And we are also afraid of ourselves. Right? Because we are afraid that we have pain or discomfort. Okay, so the title of this um, conversation is this. Earth, Wind, and Fire. So later, we'll tell you and discuss you why. But actually, this is the name of a singing group. You, you know the song? Do you remember the 21st day of September? You, you know that song? Oh, no. So, so yeah. Right? There's another song, right? Dance. Boogie Wonderland. Ha! Ha! Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm carried away. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, this, I mean th this is a group, but later we'll discuss why. And there is a subtitle for, for this conversation, and, and the subtitle is this, How to Lessen the Negative Impact of Fear. So from that question, it actually suggests that there is a positive impact of fear, right? Because I say it's negative impact. There should be a positive impact. Why? Because fear is an emotion. Like other emotion, it is a gift of God. If God give us this gift, then it should have a purpose, right? And what's the purpose of fear? Fear was given to us so that we can perceive, we can detect the danger or threat for our survival. So we have two abilities that link to fear, our ability to remember. Remember the 21st night <laughs> of September? I mean, we have that ability. We remember the past, right? and connect it to our present. That's why we have fear. Because at the past, you have this pain, or maybe you have discomfort. And then you re relate it to what is in the present. That's why you have fear. And the second is you have the ability to project, not in the camera. I mean, you have an can anticipate or see what's in the future, future danger, future threat. That's why you are worried. It is also good because you can start to plan. So that's why there's a, there's a um, positive term for fear, because it's a gift of God. So, but we will answer the question, how to lessen the negative impact of fear? Because the fear can also lead us to bad situation. And, we will, and the answer of this, we will already talk about it, and this answer, and this is the point of the message, conversation today. Focusing on God more makes our focus on fear less. Focusing on God more makes our focus on fear less. The more we focus on God, the less we focus on fear. So actually, I play on those words. You see the fear? It's two separate words, fear, less. There's also a word fearless in one word that is your totally lack of fear. It's actually a rare genetic disease, right? You know antisocial, social club? You will see some of the t-shirt, antisocial, social club, yeah? 
Antisocial sometimes is interchanged with unsociable. But antisocial has different meaning. Antisocial personality disorder is a medical condition. There are people who are not afraid. They have a lack of a sense of flight and fight response. So they don't take think of their safety and sa safety of others. That's, is, that's antisocial. So you need, you need to, to check it out, right? But um, in, 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 our, in our case, since fear is, is a gift, we have a choice, right? It's either we do something about it, like we use it for our benefit, or use it for our destruction. So that's why we don't focus much on our feelings. I'm not saying that you ignore your feelings. I'm just saying that whenever you feel something, of course you want to investigate why, why you have this feeling, why you, why you are undergoing this. And then don't forget that you keep on focusing on God. Remember David? When, when Israel was about to confront the Philistines, and then the giant, the giant is there, and the, all the Israel armies were so afraid, David, David is focusing more on God. Rather than they, he focused on that giant. But not all of us have that courage with David, right? We're not so, so brave. So I will just talk about this person. Actually, he is a very popular person because he's a prophet. He's a prophet. And we will talk about it today. He's a prophet. A prophet is, is a messenger of God. He can, they can speak and talk to, to God, and then they can relate to the people. Sometimes when the prophet comes to a place, they can, bring, can tell the judgment or the blessing to the place or to the person. So this is a prophet, and this prophet I'm talking about, he was depressed. And his name is Elijah. His name is Elijah. As, as mentioned, probably same uh, in par with Moses as well-known prophet. So now we will talk about why why Elijah was depressed? What leads him to that situation? What leads Elijah to a depressing situation? So we'll talk about that. So we learn something about it. And we also talk, talk about how God restored him and brought him out, I mean, get him out of his dire situation. Okay, so we will start when Elijah gave a prophecy. When he prayed that there will be no rain, so it will be no rain for three, three years. So God commanded Elijah, you go to the brook of Cherith. So he was there. So he get water from the brook. And then the ravens, God commanded the ravens to, to go and bring food morning and evening. Better than food panda. Right? It's free delivery. So God is providing for, for Elijah. Then, then after a while, the brook was dried up. So God commanded again Elijah to go to the town of Sarephath in Sidon. That is a, not, is a city or a town, northern part of Israel. So he went there and met the, the widow. And God made a miraculous um, thing to, this, the, uh, to the widow and the, the child. Because there, this bowl of flour and a jar of oil is never, never finished. So until the, the rain comes back, until the drought is finished. So God, after that, God asked Elijah to confront King Ahab. Okay, bef before that, I will give you a, little, uh, a, back, a bit of background. Who is the first king of Israel? King? King Saul. Then the next king is? King David. And then the next king is? King Solomon, right? With 700 wives. That's why he's so wise. Can you imagine? <laughs> he should be very wise. <laughs> I'm telling you. 700 wives. And after that, who was the next king? Actually, after that, the king was divided. There is a northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So the king of the northern part is King Ahab at this time. That is 100 years after King Solomon. And the king of the southern part is King Jehoshaphat which we, we, Pastor Romel talked about it a few, few weeks ago, right? So Elijah is a prophet giving warning to the king in the northern part, so to King Ahab. So God asked him to confront King Ahab, and then that's, that's where he is. He asked King Ahab 
Let's meet at Mount Carmel. Call all the prophets of Baal and Asherah. So Baal is actually a god of weather and thunder, like Thor and Storm. So they they have the they 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 believe that he has this ability. So that's why uh, Elijah said, just call call all the prophets, bring them, bring the, the, all the people. And of course, um, King Ahab is seems okay with that because Ka Mount Carmel is the center of Baal worship. So, nasa lugar nila. Right? So, mukhang, ano sila, malakas sila doon. So, so, it's okay. Though, then, they ask all the, the people come there. And then, Ki, I mean, Elijah asked the people, how long you'll be wavering between two opinions? What's the meaning of that? How long you've been wavering with two opinions? It means that, how long that when you call to Yahweh, or the Lord, and God didn't answer, then you call Baal. Probably Baal may answer. We have this sometimes, right? When we call God and sometimes God doesn't answer, sometimes we call another. That is their, their problem. And then the people at that time, they, they think that, okay, they didn't say anything. So Elijah proposed, made a proposal. So why not that the true God, I mean, he's saying that if, if Yahweh is the real God, let's worship him. If Baal is, if Baal is the true God, let's worship him. And this is how we're going to test who is the true God. The one who will answer by fire is the true God. So they will make a sacrifice. So the first one who do the sacrifice are the prophets of Baal. So they started to put all, all the sacrifice. They put the bull and put... Then they keep, started praying from morning. And then in the noontime, then probably... I mean, Elijah make fun with them. They say, probably Baal is sleeping, Baal is traveling, right? So better check in his Facebook, where is he now? Right? But, but actually, they didn't feel offended. Why? Because they really believe that he travels. Yeah. So, so as I was wondering why, why, he, why we, we think that way. So anyway, they, they pray louder. But in the evening time, no Baal, no answer from Baal. So now it's time for Elijah. So Elijah prepared the altar for God. He put all the bull there. And then he put three jars of water. He put a trench. Trench is where the water may, may be collected. So he poured a water there, four jars, and he poured it three times. Can you imagine? And then Elijah prayed to God. And God, Yahweh, answered him by sending a fire from heaven. Then probably, I mean, Elijah will be so, so happy, right? Can you imagine how he should be singing, right? This bull is on fire, right? <laughs> yeah, this bull is on fire. Not only the bull, but also the stone, the woods, and all, everything. That, yeah, it's, it's on fire. But some people at our time, maybe they will question you. They may ask you, especially the skepticals. They may, skeptics, maybe they ask, it's not impossible. It's not impossible that this happened, right? It might be an asteroid in just in perfect time, came from heaven, hit the place. It's just a coincidence. You, you know, you already, I already tell the story when I was 16 years old, right? When I was choosing my career. Then God, I, I prayed for that, and then I opened up my eyes, and I saw the sign. Remember that? I'm not praying for the sign, though, just to, link, to clarify. I'm praying for guidance, because some people, we pray for the sign. So I'm just praying for guidance. I'm asking for, for the Lord's help. And it, actually, there's some sister asked ask me, Kuya, there's a dance for that. Are you expecting me to dance on the stage? Nah, I will not dance. <laughs> yeah, I mean... So, so I, I already, uh, when, when God answered me, because there's a sign, electronics and communication engineering lab, then I took the, the course. So that's ECE. I, I think in Singapore, there's no ECE anymore, electronics and communication engineering. So, so my, my parents actually was a bit worried. Parang, ano kayang trabaho ng anak <laughs> makukuha niya sa, sa ganyang course? So probably they were wondering why I choose this this course. Then finally, one of my, I mean, acquaintance of my parents asked me, what's your course? I say, ECE. Then, they, then he said that, 
wow, that's a very good course. Then finally, wow, someone knows. I was, someone knows. That's a very good course, electrical and civil engineering. Yeah, yeah, man, Yeah, you're right. <laughs> uh, you're right. So anyway, I thought there's someone already knows my course, but what? That's, you know how God do a miracle? It's not because you're waiting for an impossible to become possible. When God do a miracle, He make a provision. He provides. That is God's providence and God's timing. That's how He make a, he make a miracle. You know why, why I, my parents didn't really ask me what course to take? Probably you're wondering. Because most of the parents here will, will tell their kids right, what course to take. But my parents didn't. Because my mom and my dad already told me, we cannot, we cannot help you to take your university. Hindi ka, I cannot, we cannot afford. Hindi namin kaya na makapunta ka sa university. That's why I look for a way. And that's the start. When God answered me that prayer, I know God will help me along the way and able to finish it in five years. And all because of God's provision. That's a miracle. When time that you really need it, you really need it, when you call a God, then God answered your prayer. That's God's timing. That's how God made a miracle. And that's how I able to finish my university, not because of my strength. It is because God provided for everything. Amen? Because God provided for everything. So, this is after what happened. The king, who is King Ahab, went back home. And he tell all the story to his wife. The name of his wife is Jezebel. So Jezebel was so angry. So this is what he said. She said, So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me. If by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you have killed them. So Jezebel is threatening Elijah. So what do you think Elijah's response? He should be so brave, right? But this is Elijah's response. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. It's so, it seems to me you cannot understand. Right? I understand if King Ahab is afraid of his wife. Right, guys? Right, there are some guys who are afraid to, right? Don't look around. Don't look around. You know who I'm talking to. Don't look around. Yeah, I mean, in my family, I made it clear to my wife that I am the man of the house. Yes, I made it clear. True, I will see, so you're... You no, know, I really tell I am the man of the house and I have the last say. Yes, darling. Yes, darling. May lambing sa dulo. Ling. Right? Yeah, young people, young people. I, I know it's not a good relationship advice. But I'm, I'm just telling you. You will remember this conversation. <laughs> so what, what I mean is, El Jezebel is not a wife of Elijah, right? So why, why he will be afraid of Jezebel? Why Elijah will be afraid of the power of Jezebel when, when he is relying on the power of God? He just defeated a prophet of Baal. And all of the prophets of Baal was killed. He just have seen how God made a miracle, right? But yet he was afraid. It's actually it's the same with us, right? Whenever we hear, we heard the news right now. I mean, we, we suddenly become afraid and forget, forgot that God has been faithful for us in the past. He is also human, like us. He is also human. But this fear actually led him to even a deeper, deeper trouble. He went on alone to the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary, solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. So you see how fear and discouragement led him to even a worse condition that he is so depressed. He is so depressed that he even want to die. That's what he's, he's, he's undergoing now. That's, that's why we, we want to discuss about, about this because the danger, the danger of this is real. That fear can really lead us to a something that is so, so bad that we really cannot get out of it. But God is so, so great. God is so good. That after this, after, after when he went to the broom tree, he fell asleep, God sent an angel and then he woke, the angel woke up 
um, Elijah. And then when, after, and when he woke up, he see the, the bread and the, the drink. Then he able to eat and drink, and then he sleep again. And then another time, the angel of the Lord came back, woke him up again, and they gave him food. Can you imagine? If God can provide for Elijah, so are we. Amen? So when he is strengthened up, he continues his journey to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. Okay, so he, he went there to a place where, actually in Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai is where the place where Moses seen the glory of God. When, when God asked, uh, told him that I will pass my glory, then he seen the glory of God pass by. This is where be the place. Okay? And that's it. I'm done. I'm done with the introduction. No, I'm, I'm just saying you that all of this introduction goes to the, another very important part of what we're going to talk about. This is the this, uh, conversation between God and Elijah. This is a conversation. So this one is the time when God is trying to help Elijah get out of his depression. Remember that whenever God asked him, he always commanded him to go somewhere. But this time, God never told him to come to the mountain of God. That's why God asked him this question. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, Elijah? Have you asked? Probably God, sometimes you are in, the, in a tr trouble and then probably God will ask you, why are you in that situation? Why are you in that situation? The same question, what are you doing here, Elijah? And then this is the answer of Elijah. He replied, I am very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. What's the Tagalog of zealous? Hindi ziluso. Baka ziluso, no? What's the Tagalog of zealous? Masigasig. Napakasigasig niya sa pagsisilbi sa Panginoon. So, so probably it's a self-pity. So he's trying to say that I've been doing everything for you. It's like that. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. Torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword, and I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. He felt alone. He felt defenseless with the power, ungodly powers. That's what probably we also have this, this kind of experience, right? Sometimes we, feel, we thought that we're alone. Sometimes we felt that we're help, helpless. It's the same thing. He is a man of God. He is a prophet, but he has this feeling. But God is merciful, you know? God is so merciful. Instead of scolding him, what God do? He give him an instruction and demonstration. God said to him, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Go out. But actually, he didn't go out. He didn't budge. Probably he's just still in his, in his feeling, in his emotion that he's there. Or probably because things is really very, very fast. We, we have uh, some reasoning behind. But even though, he still didn't get out of the, the cave. The next thing what happened is this. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. So you can see here that there is a very strong wind. And which reminds us of another story of Peter with the disciples. They are on the boat, right? And then in the middle of, of the sea and stormy nights, then they saw Jesus walking on top of the water. And they were so afraid. Why? Because they've seen a ghost, right? Are you still afraid of the ghost? <laughs> well, I, mean, I mean, even the kids right now, they are not afraid of the ghost, right? Because there's so such thing as ghosts. So we always keep on telling our kids, right? But they're afraid to lose their phones, right? So, but anyway, Jesus was there telling them, don't be afraid, I, it's me. Then, then Peter said, okay, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. Then Jesus asked him to come. So he get up, stepped out of the boat and he walked. But when he saw the wind, he become, became afraid. This is the same thing. Elijah and Peter we're afraid of the situation that we're in. It's the same as in us. But God is patient with us. God will help us. That's why we need God's help. And then the next thing is this. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. So this is where I get the title. Earthquake and fire. <laughs> right? 
Can, can you imagine all the calamities? Actually, it, if you have been in the Philippines, all the calamities you already experienced. You probably experienced earthquake, typhoon, especially typhoon. Every year we all have a typhoon, very strong winds and fire. Right? And God is uh, just telling, telling him that all of these calamities, all of these events, everything, God is in control. If God will not allow him to be harmed, he will not be harmed. Can you imagine all of this? He didn't be harmed. He even didn't be killed because of what's happening. Right? Yeah, that's, that's what also... Remember when they probably help someone who experienced fire? Actually, if there's a fire, you are really in panic mode, right? So you get everything. You have the adrenaline. Get everything. Get the probably the refrigerator. Get out of the old house sofa. Break everything out. Out from your house, right? Then after everything is okay, then you be, then one of our neighbors is asking uh, her her daughter, what, what are you holding? Because usually you will bring all the important things, right? So she is holding the pillow, it, which makes sense, right? If you don't have a house, at least you have a pillow <laughs> to sleep on. It makes sense. So, and then when when after after this fire, what are you gonna do? You bring back your things, and then you cannot carry it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so heavy, like especially the refrigerator. So everything, all of these things, we it, God understands because we are human. We react on those things. We react on calamities. That's why we need God's help. We need God's help. And this is how God helped Elijah. And after the fire, there was a sound of gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. So Elijah recognized the voice of God. That is the only time he realized God is speaking through me and asking, as, as, as asking me something, right? He asking, asking him something. Then he went out of the cave. Because that's God's command, right? Go get out of the cave. He never did for, for that few 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 minutes or seconds or hours, I don't know. But that's the only time he went out, when he recognized God's. And then the voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And then he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, turned down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left and now they're trying to kill me. It's the same thing because he's still feeling hurt or feeling, feeling depressed. It's the same thing. And God's still patient. God's still merciful. He never He never scolded him, and, but gave him an instruction. Another instruction. And this is instruction. Go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. He gave him a, an instruction. Because you know what? Our obedience to God, our obedience to God is an act of surrender. And when we surrender God and we ask the Lord that you, Lord, manifest in my life, take control of my life, that's where you're allowing Him to move. And now, and now Elijah, I mean, no, God is asking Elijah to allow God to move in his life. That's why he's giving an instruction. And he gave other instructions like you, you anoint the king of, I mean, Hazael as the king of Aram, Jehu the king of Israel, and Elisha to be the next prophet. So all of these three people will actually purge all the Baal worship and all of this. And then this God assured him, yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. See how God is telling him, because we have this tendency that when we are really in trouble, we usually looking inside and we feel that we are alone, right? That's his, the, same, the same problem with, with Elisha. He feels that he's alone, but God is telling him, no, you're not alone. I actually, I've actually preserved 7,000 people for you. So after all, what he was thinking is a lie. What he's think, saying to himself is a lie. Actually, there are some people still not serving Baal or Baal. And on verse 19, I want you to read that when you go back home. Verse 19, this is what Elijah did. He obeyed God. Because God asked him to go, right? So he obeyed God. As I mentioned to you, the moment we obey God, 
That's the time we surrender our God. That's the time we are shifting our focus from ourselves to God. And this is how what's happening. God is telling, telling him, I'm shifting your focus from yourself to a better one, and he is God. That's why focusing on God more makes our focus on fear less. So I will give you an uh, illustration so that you understand more about, about focus. Because actually, you cannot really um, chase two rabbits at the same time, right? If you have two rabbits, you, can, you only need to choose one. We focus more on God rather than we focus on, on fear. Because we cannot focus in, in many things. If you're doing multi multitask, you definitely will focus on one thing rather than the other thing. So that's, that's, that's it. When you start focusing on God, definitely your focus on fear will become less. That's, the, that's what I'm trying to illustrate and what I'm trying to say. And then, Pastor Gig, uh, Louis Gigli also gave another proposal, another solution of our problem with fear. And actually, after studying it, it actually leads back to the same, the same point. And I quote this what he said. Faith is the antidote to fear. Faith is the antidote to fear. Remember that fear rooted its, its um, power from uncertainty, while faith is being certain. You know, some people will change, interchange faith and belief. Belief is we, what are the things that we accept as true, even though we don't, we don't have a proof. Yeah, that's belief. But faith, according to the Bible in Hebrews chapter 11, faith is being sure, being certain of what we hope for. That's what we, we have in, in Hebrews chapter 11, all right? Being certain of what we hope for. So that's why if fear is uncertainty and faith is being certain, so the only way to cure fear is faith. Because certainty will cure uncertainty. Remember when, the, when you feel something, you go to the doctor, right? And then you ask the doctor to, oh, I feel this, I feel that. And then the doctor will ask for some kind of test. And then, then they will say to the to lab, to lab. And then you go back home and then you're waiting for a call, right? But what do you expect when someone call? Someone call you because of the lab test. What do you expect? The doctor will say, the doctor will say, oh, I think God is speaking to you. <laughs> no, no, right? The doctor will not say that. A doctor will say what is written on the test, right? It means he makes uncertainty certain because it is what is written in the lab. And did he say that these things is written here in the laboratory results shows that you have nothing to worry about? He will not be Worried about. That's why the certainty of being certain will, fa will cure uncertainty. Faith will cure fear. But if fear is being certain, then what makes your belief certain? Paano, mo nakak paano ka nakakasiguro sa paniniwala mo? So at the end of the day, it is your, the object of faith. Kung saan nakasalalay ang iyong pananampalataya. The object of your faith. Because people will believe in themselves. People will believe in other people. We believe in their strength. We believe in other gods. Or we believe in Superman. Everything. They can believe, right? But the Bible is telling us to have faith in Christ. That is why we are saying that faith in Christ is the antidote to fear. Not faith in faith. Not faith alone. Faith in Christ. Because Christ, Jesus is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. The author, the originator, the initiator of our faith. He is the one who made the foundation of our faith. And the foundation of our faith is truth. Because truth remains. Truth remains. Whether you believe it or not, truth remains. Right? The truth of gravity. If you say, I don't believe, I don't believe in gravity, I don't believe in gravity, then you started to float. Have you seen someone like that? Started to float. <laughs> oh, brother, brother, believe in gravity. I believe, I believe. And then you go down. <laughs> no, 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 no. It doesn't happen. <laughs> because it remains, what, whether you believe it or not, gravity is there. The truth of gravity is there. the same truth that we have. The truth in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the truth. And Jesus, according to historical accounts, he was born 
in Bethlehem. According to historical accounts that he was crucified, he was buried, he rose again from the dead. According to historical accounts, we are not talking about his as legend. We are talking about a historical account. Meaning, it's not only written in the Bible, it's also written with other accounts, with evidence that he rose from the dead. That's the foundation of our faith. Thus, we found our faith in based on truth. Amen? That's why, never lose focus on Christ. You know the, the statement before this? And this will be the last, the last slide. The statement before this is actually the, my point. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Never lack focus. Keep focusing. It's a continuous thing. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Because Jesus is the one who made uncertainty certain, who made the unknown known, who made the, the crushing spirit to be alive, the one who overcame the world. It is Jesus. Amen? It is Jesus. So I fix your eyes on Jesus. And this is, remember the story of just now about Peter? When Peter was, when, when, when Jesus asked him to come out, then Peter stepped out from the boat, right? Then started to walk in the water. So do you think it is Peter's strength that he can walk the water? It is God's power, right? The only part of Peter is when he decides to step out on the boat. That's his part, the decision to obey. He decided to obey Christ's command. He come out of the boat, started to walk in the water. Then when he saw the, the wind, he was afraid. And then he said, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. And then immediately Jesus grabbed him from his hand and caught him. That is God's timing. That is God's miracle. When you are in need, that you really call on, Lord, help me. I don't know what to do. Lord, help me. He is in perfect timing to help. Amen? Hallelujah. That's what wonderful our God is. What are you afraid of? Who are you afraid of? Where is that fear coming from? Always remember that God is before us. God is behind us. That God is beside us. That Christ himself is in us. And through us, God will make wonders through your life. Amen? Through you, God will make wonders to the lives of other people and tell you that they also will see that God is able to help us in our situation.